and now we will get into uh, input output file systems. So I will not talk about directories much I will be mostly talking about files. Uh, we have already looked at file input and output through F stream. Today I want to trace in complete detail what exactly happens when you use an F stream to dump data and read data. Okay. So there, there should be absolutely no confusion left at the end of it. So what is a file? A file is an 1D array of bytes on disk. Just like memory is a 1D array or vector, a file is also a 1D array of bytes with the difference that it exists on disk and so it is slower to access. There is no other difference. It can grow and shrink at the end just like a vector. Interpreting the bytes is the business of the program that uses the file. The operating system does not care what you store in a file. I will talk about the hex dump utility which lets you see what is in a file byte by byte printed in hex. It is a very simple utility that Linux provides to you. Now if the file is a text file or maybe a .cpp file then those bytes are assumed to be ASCII codes. But bytes in a.out are not supposed to be ASCII codes. They are assumed to be compiled executable code that are directly loaded into a CPU and run. So same byte different purpose. Now we all know how to use an OS stream but let us just go ahead and see what the code looks like. You include F stream, you use namespace std then you say OF stream OF and give a path to some file. If your path does not start with a slash then it is offset with respect to the current directory where the program is running. Otherwise it starts from the root of the file system. In this case I am printing out 2 and 3 which are interpreted as integers and then I am printing out 2 minus 3 as an integer and then I am printing a new line. So what happens in all this? If the file does not exist it is created empty. If it exists it is truncated to 0 bytes. A right cursor is initialized to 0. When you open the file like that that is what happens. After that point if I am printing that 3 what happens? The 3 is an integer it occupies 4 bytes in RAM or in a register. The first thing that happens is that that integer 3 is translated to a string 3. They are different things. Okay. The ASCII code byte for character 3 which happens to be 0x33, hex 33 that is appended to the file and the write cursor is incremented by 1 byte because they have written out hex 33 to the output stream. Okay. Similarly when I look at 2 minus 3 the result is minus 1. In this case 2 characters will be written out. One is the ASCII code for minus, the other is the ASCII code for 1. So in all 2, 3, minus 1, 4 ASCII code bytes will be written out. And finally there will be the NL. Now just for our convenience people cannot agree on things. So Unix and Linux systems indicate end of line with one character. Whereas Windows and DOS they indicate end of line with two characters just to make life more interesting. So on Linux the hex code 0a or decimal 10 which means line feed that is written out to the output stream and the write cursor increased by 1. In Windows 0d which is called carriage return followed by 0a which is line feed are written and now the write cursor will be increased by 2. So you have the exact same C++ code the files they will create on disk will be 1 byte different in size. We can avoid this mess by suitable flags to the F stream class. We will see that a little later. But let us write this code. It is a very silly piece of code. Let us just go ahead and write it. And of course, of.close makes sure that the file is not cached in RAM. All bytes have been actually flushed to disk and very simple, you know, and just closes the resources. So I create the code. Uh -huh. I 
think it's coming from this character. Quotes are not the same. There we go. So now, if I run hex dump, it just runs, dumping this file called dump dot text. What do I find in dump dot text? Two three minus one. Okay. Remember, I didn't put any spaces anywhere. So two three minus one, and a new line, which is why I'm on this line. Otherwise, this C would immediately follow the one. Okay. Now let's run this hex dump utility to see what's in there in the file. So I say hex dump dump dot text. So what's in that file? Byte by byte in hexadecimal code. Okay. So this first column shows you the byte number inside the file. Okay. So you can see a whole bunch of weird stuff. All right. Let me. This is probably I need some flags. I think it has some. Canonical hex plus ASCII display. That's right here. So if I hex dump dash c the file, this is what I see. Okay. So to the right, it shows whatever it can print. Any unprintable character like new line is showed with a dot. Okay. And here it says that at byte offset zero in the file, the first byte is ASCII code three two. Which corresponds to the digit two, not the integer two, but the written digit two. The next byte is the ASCII code for the written digit three, which is three three. Then I have the ASCII code for the minus sign, which is two D. Then I have the ASCII code for one, which is three one. As you can see, one two and three are three one, three two, three three hex. And finally, there's the new line, which is zero A, as I promised. Okay. So in other words, this file has five. Bytes, and those byte values are those. Okay. So that's what happens when you write to a f stream or to C out using the less less construct. Okay. Now, let me change this slightly and uh, say that I want to save the hex uh, number, say two, three, four, five, a, b, c, d. That's a valid integer. Okay. Now, if I uh, run hex dump, the stuff in dump is this large integer, which corresponds to this hex number. Okay. Now, again, if I hex dump this guy, you can see that. How many bytes have been written? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and and the actual thing that's in the file is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and the new line. So ten characters have been written. That costs you ten bytes on the file. So if I say ls dash l dump dot text, you can see that the size is ten. Okay. So I use ten bytes to write down an integer to file. Where the original integer fit inside four bytes. So clearly, this is not such a nice idea. Okay. Can we do better? And the answer is that we don't want this translation into ASCII and back. We want to store it on the disk exactly like the four bytes that are stored in RAM. Okay. And we'll do that as follows. So now there's also this thing called iOS, which is a class coming alongside FStream. Which lets you do a few things while opening files. For example, you can open a file in binary mode, which doesn't do this CRLF patch up. So, okay, it doesn't distinguish between any you know, Windows files, Unix files. If you are using binary files to dump integers and doubles and so on in low level format, then you should use binary format so that an accidental occurrence of 0D and 0A doesn't appear like a new line. Okay. Otherwise, this system will translate it for you, thinking it's the end of line. So, it's safest to always open binary files in binary mode. You should. If you open with a flag, I'll show how to apply the flag soon. There's a flag called ATE, I have no idea why. Then you position a right cursor to the end of the file. So if the file already exists, you'll leave the content unchanged and you'll put the right cursor at the end rather than at the beginning of the file. And you can also truncate an existing file by force by saying iOS trunk. Okay, it's similar to vector.resize0. 
So F streams can read and write a file at the same time. And we'll use this to dump our data in low level binary format. So F streams are opened like as follows, F stream FS passed to file like before. You pass it these flags, you say open it in binary mode and let me do both in and out on that file. So I should be able to both read and write. So what are these vertical bars? Those are the bitwise OR operators. So in fact, all these flags, iOS binary, iOS in, iOS out, these are just integers. But they are all powers of 2 inside the system. When you OR them, various bits are set. And F stream class reads that integer and finds out what bits are set to decide how to start up the F stream class, whether I should change the right cursor and so on correctly. And then the F stream class provides, provides these all important methods. So look at these three or four methods very carefully. Generally speaking, you should never do less than, less than or greater than, greater than on F streams because you are using it for low level binary data. You do not want formatting into ASCII at all. So the only thing you are allowed to do on an F stream is read and write character buffers. So suppose I have a character buffer with 100 bytes, you could try to do read into the buffer 100 bytes from F stream. So wherever the read or get cursor is placed, from that point onwards read ahead 100 bytes and load that into buffer. Suppose the file is over before that, then the file will set a fail or end of file flag and you can check for that. We will come back to that later on. On the other side, you can tell FS to write to disk the contents of buffer for 100 characters starting at the current position of the write cursor, whatever the write cursor is currently. Okay. That may end up in extending the file if there is not enough space, just like vectors can get extended by pushback. Okay. So this basically says push back 100 bytes from the content of the buffer to the file, whatever the end cursor is. But unlike pushback, the write cursor can also be repositioned to an interior of the file. So you can overwrite if you want. You can actually ask for where the cursor positions are. You can say tell G is tell me where the get cursor is, the read cursor. Tell P is tell me where the put cursor is, that is the write position. Okay. And what you get back is not an integer but it is a pause type. Why is that? Because if it were an integer, we could only support files which are up to about 2 billion bytes which is not large by today's standards. You could definitely have multi gigabyte files and you run out of offset. That is why the, the offset in a file is defined in a generic way called pause type. Pause type is either 64 bits or it is 32 bits, you do not have to know. It is an offset of a byte in a file. Just like ints are used to index into vectors, pause type is used to index into files to get a byte. Okay. And finally, you can also set the cursor positions by saying seek G, seek the, to the following position. Okay. Go to GX or seek P, position the put cursor to PX, where GX and PX have to be pause type. Tell G and tell P are methods defined inside F stream that tells you where the read and write cursors are currently located. Any act of reading and writing will move around the read and write cursors. G is get okay. and P is put, put is write. Okay. So this is how it works in a particular file. So think of the file as a contiguous chunk of bytes. Every read will advance GX, every write will advance PX. But there is no necessary ordering between GX and PX in general because you are allowed to move them around. Okay. We can also set this up, set up GX and PX using seek G and seek P. Okay. And the current positions can be known by calling tell G and tell P. Writing may extend the file, reading will never extend the file. Reading may run out of bytes and signal an end of file. Okay. So this is the current situation. Now armed with that we will write this interesting class. So so far we have been looking at you know, boost vectors which know how to dump themselves to a file and read themselves from a file. But those have been in the non-compact ASCII format complete with brackets and commas and all kinds of stuff. And clearly if there are large elements you will take many more bytes to write them than just a double or a float. Just like we saw, to save one integer you might take 10 bytes. Okay. So we do not want that. We, do, we want to write a new vector class say. We will not use boost, we will just start from the standard vector class. We want to write a vector class which is capable of dumping itself to disk in compact format in exactly the amount of space required by its com components, elements. 
and it can also load itself up from a disk file. So let us write that. So the way to do that is to inherit from the vector class. Before we get to general inheritance, let us look at simple inheritance from our point class. Remember our point class had a struct had a double x and double y coordinate. If I now want colored points, I can extend the point class by saying struct colored point colon public point means anything that was in point will remain public in the new class. But I will add a public field called color. Now you could also say I want a mass with the point because I am simulating planets. Then you can say colored point mass extends colored point with a mass. So your extensions of classes or inheritance can go multiple levels. Okay. So similarly we will do when we write a vector that reads and writes itself we will use inheritance. So boost lets you read and write matrices but these are in textual format. So we would like to store an integer in exactly 4 bytes on the disk file as well. But we cannot directly view this file because it does not have ASCII character codes in it. If we try to do that you will get some garbage. Now to store a vector int to disk we will first store the size in 4 bytes and then we will store each element in 4 bytes. That will also let us read it from start to finish easily. Okay. So here is the code. So here is my read write vector class. I use fstream and I use vector and I have rw vector which inherits from public vector int. So all methods in vector int will still be available to any user of rw vector. How do I load it from the file system? If I am loading it the assumption is I am deleting the current state of the vector entirely so I resize to 0. The original elements of the vector all go away. Nn is the number of elements I have to read from the file and of course load takes a argument which is the name of the file which is given as a car star. Now I open an if stream because I am only going to read it ifs with file name and I want to read it in binary mode so that I do not do any mess with new line stuff. Okay. Now the important thing is this read statement. Remember the read can only read character buffers. Okay. But what I want to read is an integer nn. nn takes 4 bytes. So what I do is I take an address to nn and I pretend to the system that it is a character point. I also tell the read to read a number of bytes which is the size of nn. So there is a size of operator in C and C++ which tells you how many bytes of RAM this item needs to store. So size of nn will evaluate to 4 internally. You should not use 4 because someday someone may change this type to long long or something and then 4 will be incorrect. Okay. So what this does is it reads 4 bytes from disk in order and it lays it out exactly in the 4 bytes of RAM which you are supposed to be storing nn. Okay. So the picture, so let us say here is my RAM. And here are the 4 bytes, nn is basically at this address which is say 10,000. On Meanwhile on the file there are these 4 bytes, okay, byte b0, b1, b2, b3 and my get cursor is here. At this point if I take ampersand nn that literally translates to byte address 10,000. I make it a character pointer and then I say read 4 bytes from the file. So these 4 bytes are read and because I passed address 10,000 to the read command or read method those bytes are literally pasted into those 4 positions. But now I am free to go back and interpret that as an integer. So let us see how I will store the vector to a disk file. So I open an OF stream with the file name and iOS binary, no new line conversions. And now the first thing I have to dump is the size of the array. Right. So what I do is I say int nn equals whose size? My size. So since I am inheriting from that object, all fields and methods of the object are still available to me. So I can just call size. Okay. And now I say of stream dot write again I have to pass it a fake character pointer but which is actually pointing to the 
starting byte of the integer called nn. And I also have to give it how many bytes to write, which will be 4 bytes. This will do the reverse process. It will look at 4 bytes in RAM, which represent the number nn, and transfer those 4 bytes exactly in that order to disk. Okay. See, I'm not using less than, less than, or greater than, nothing like that. After this, what do I do? For int ix equal to 0, ix less than nn plus plus ix, I have to now write out all the members in this vector. Right? So here there may be a bit of a mess because what do I write? This box that doesn't quite work. Is there a get in the vector method? I don't exactly know. So suppose I say int element equals what? This. So you might say it should look like this, you know, this expression, but that will not work. Anyone knows how to do this? I think that works. Let's try it out. I'll explain if it works. Okay, it's only complaining about main, therefore it's pretty much done. Let me provide a main and then I'll come back to explaining what's going on too. Empty for now. Okay. So what's happening here is Remember I refer to size because there is a size of the current object. The current object basically is an extension of a vector int and so I can always access size of that vector. Similarly, remember vector also provides an indexed element access operator. Unfortunately that has no other name and so those operators that are overridden like plus or multiply or boxes, you actually have to say invoke operator box on this object with argument ix that gets you the next the element at ix that is the syntax it is just mambo jambo. Huh? Uh, in this case you we do not okay, let, let me try this uh, I have never tried this actually bingo okay. so you can just say operator box with ix fine. Now after that of course we have the job of writing it out to the file okay. so I say element and size of element. So I try, yeah. Ah, so I am going to do that right now. Okay. So let us leave our implementation of load unspecified. Let us not bother. Let us just say that uh, what was the class again? RW vector in all lower case. So we will say RW vector um, RWV. Okay. Then we will say RW vector dot push back um, say uh, 5. RW vector push back uh, 656 okay. and then I will do RW vector dot store okay. and then I will do dump dot binary. This is no longer a text file. Okay. So observe that the method called push back is coming from the original implementation of vector int, but the method store is not defined in vector int that is defined here. So think of it as overlaying a your new definitions of methods on top of the earlier ones. If you define something here which is already defined in vector, your definition will have precedence because you are layering on your implementation on top of the lower implementation. Okay. But we are not doing that, store was not defined and therefore there is only one store and I have to give it a file name. So I have given a file name dump.bin. So let us try to compile this and see what happens. Um, from string constant to car star, oh, okay, 35. Uh, let us not bother with that, it is just being uh, <coughs> pedantic. So now suppose we run rw vector dot exe, okay. it runs and it leaves behind a file called dump dot bin. Okay. Why is it 12 bytes? I wrote the size, then I wrote 2 integers, so it is 3 integers or 12 bytes. No new line, nothing. Okay. What is the contents of it? Let us see. So I will do a, you know, if I try to cat dump dot bin change foreign characters weird stuff okay maybe my screen is messed up trying to print weird no not yet okay so the safe thing is to do a hex dump so if you do hex dump dash c dump dot bin let's see what the characters are there right so 
So see first of all the very first byte I write the, the very first integer I write is 4 bytes. What are the contents 0 2 0 0 0 0 0 0. So it writes from the least significant byte onwards. The actual number I wrote first is the number of elements which is 2. 2 written in hex is 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 2. So read it like Urdu from right to left. So the first 4 bytes record the size the number of elements then there is 5 okay and then there is 656 which happens to be 0 to 90 hex which written out to full integer specification is 0 0 0 0 0 to 0 90. Total bytes is 12 bytes because there are 3 integers being written here. Isn't there maybe a starting, uh, starting code ending? Nothing, it's bare. Yeah. That might change. How does the system know that the file has ended and would continue reading further? Just because you read the 2 blindly first, you realize how many more things to read. Because the first number is 2. So the convention is the number of elements is always written as the first integer in 4 bytes. So it's always safe to read 4 bytes because even the empty vector will have 4 bytes saying 0. And then you read as many more 4 bytes as you require. The assumption is that you are creating these files purely with stored and then reading them with load. If, if for some reason the file is corrupted, sure, there will be a problem. Or if there is a bug in the stored code, there will be a problem. Sure. Okay. If we, there is no metadata, that is the point. So there is no what is called metadata, there is no description of the data anywhere. If tomorrow your source code changes, you are on your own. So, and if, if you have created like 500 data files on disk and the source code changes, it is up to you to coordinate the change between the data file and the source code. So Java does that by the Java serialization standard. So you can store various hash codes of the, obje of the object and various things to make sure that you do not try to illegally read stuff which this class did not create. There is no, no safeguard here. In C++ there is absolutely no safeguard. There are other bigger packages and libraries written for that purpose. There is the Google protobuf package which you can use for that. If you want to find out about that you can go and research it. So now let us look at the load routine. Okay. So the load routine empties out the current vector state to have 0 length. Then the first thing it does is as I said read 4 bytes to find out what how many more elements it has to read. And then inside as long as nn is nn minus minus is more than 0 okay, as long as there is more stuff to read it initializes an lm which is an int in this case it is an int vector and then it reads what does it read an address to lm fact as a character pointer and 4 bytes. And then once it has lm it pushes it back to the current vector pushback is a method in this vector I can always use it from any other method in an extended class. And finally in all cases I have to close, I did not close the OFS, it is a little funny that it still worked out fine, it might not have okay. and then IFS dot close. Okay. So now suppose I have RW vector say RW v2, okay. I can now say RW v2 dot load dumb dot bin and that will load up the same elements okay. For example, I can at least as a indicator uh, write out its size let us see if that comes out correctly. Line 15 so there are some colon problems. Hmm? Ah. So forget about those. C out was not declared because I didn't uh, I didn't have IEO stream in it. So deprecation is fine. This is just a warning. So now if I do that, the file will be written afresh and then the vector will be loaded up with the proper size of 2. 
So you can even print out the elements and fine. So questions on this. So the main things to learn here are that by taking an address of any primitive object and then also knowing its size using a size of operator, I can use that variable and its size in calls to read and write inside F stream. And this will transfer the bytes used directly to the other guy, to the file or back between file and RAM. Okay. The important thing to note is you can't do that with composite objects like vectors. You have to write your code to do this. Only primitive objects which are packed densely in RAM can do this. Okay. Structs can do this, generally speaking. Structs with primitive things in it can be written out. But structs with a vector in it can't be. Okay. It has to give a contiguous byte sequence for you to transfer it as a contiguous byte sequence to disk. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So suppose in here, RWV is a read-write vector which extends vector. So I can always have an expression of the form RWV two, right? This and this box bracket open and close is actually not supported primitively in the language. When you say RWV box 2, this box bracket is translated into a method call. So you declare that method by saying it is an operator with an argument which is an int. Okay. Somewhere inside vector, there was a declaration of the following form public, public is already that. So int operator box int ix return stuff. That is how the implementer of vector told the C++ system that hereafter on a vector you can call an operator with box brackets with an argument which is an integer for the index. The return is like you know from that native buffer you might want to return whatever p a i x that sort of thing because we are not implementing it I cannot use PA. If you remember in the other uh, this class when you are implementing vectors see in this get class I was giving an offset and I was returning a float. Now that means that inside main you cannot really use you cannot, you cannot say so far vec1 of vx this is not allowed. If you wanted to do that to make it even closer to the system's vector implementation, then you would have to declare an operator. So instead of having a get like this, you would have to say float operator int p const, where inside you would have the same code okay? or you can say return get p, that would also work. Hmm? Const is because I am only accessing the pth element, I am not changing it, that is why. Just like get was not changing. Okay. So if you define it like this and then at the end you say try to say something like vec vx equal to something, that will flag an error. But the point is that this is these things are declared like operators, so that you get the comfort of using native array like constructs. Now the problem with operators is that later on if you have to use them, you have to invoke them like this, you have to say operator box. See you, otherwise you might have thought that I should be able to write int lm equal to ix, like this, this is ix, right. So you should be able to say this addo ix, but somehow they have a problem with this syntax. So that is why they, uh, in, they make sure that you have to explicitly write down the word operator, that is all. No, this is not allowed. So the standard C++ syntax is that you have to say operator followed by exactly how it was declared with the argument list in standard rounded brackets. It is just a convention, nothing profound about it. Size of is a predefined language construct which tells you the number of bytes it takes to represent a primitive object. It is defined already in C and C++. Any other question? So the summary is that by casting it by taking an address to any primitive object, primitive type and then casting it into carstar and giving it the number of bytes to read and write, you can transfer the memory of that primitive variable directly to and from disk.
that's the bottom line and we have here used it to extend the class vector of ints to be able to dump it to file and load it from file very efficiently you use exactly the same number of bytes as in ram okay now for the last uh, exercise here so suppose suppose things get pretty extreme suppose i want to represent a vector which is like 50 gigabytes large and you don't have enough ram for that you don't care if your code is a little slow but you just want to run code with a 50 gigabyte large array how do you do that so you want to represent we want to write a new class called file vector which doesn't even have any existence on the stack or heap it's entirely implemented on disk okay we already have the pieces we need to the puzzle right we know how to seek preposition the read and write cursor that's equivalent to indexing we should be able to do this it can be deathly slow but let's do it and see so class file vector as a public interface provides a constructor this time even in the constructor and in the file name because it's a file which is storing the data it's not in memory okay and i'll have to give it a size which is the number of items you want to put in that um that array then we have the put get and size methods very simple so i'd say put float value val into logical you know index number ix or retrieve the element at the ix index okay so start declaring some stuff what else do i need so private what do i have to store in private the file stream itself that the end user should not see and the size so for simplicity the size will not change once the array is created the size will be fixed the public stuff will be that i give you a file name and a size and uh, let's see so i set size to the underscore size and then i open so the other thing is if you don't want to open the file right there that's just a declaration of a private member you can open it in the constructor so here is an example where the constructor does allocate resource but it's not heap resource okay so and then inside it gives the file name and then i say i want to open it in binary mode i want to both read and write it okay in the destructor i close the file now you might argue that in some applications you may also want to delete the file at that point from disk okay you can do that if you want size is just return size nothing else to do so what does put do so now because files are indexed exclusively in byte units you have to do your translation between byte offsets and float offsets if i say that i want to write the float val at index ix in the file i need to seek to byte number ix time size of float just like our cell cell number to byte offset kind of thing and then i use exactly the same uh, logic as before fs dot write car star val size of val that's it how would get the seek remains exactly the same i need to seek to the same point given ix and then i just read So I read those four bytes corresponding now to a float into answer, and I return answer. Okay. Now this is a relatively sloppy implementation. Well, if you are give me a size beyond end of file, you'll get a error and so on. Okay. Now, so an interesting thing is this: that when I create the file, observe that the file may not have existed. In which case, when I open it, the file has size zero. and the write cursor and read cursor are both positioned at zero what happens if the first method call i make says put an element at position 1 million let's do it and see okay first let's try to compile this
Okay, some weird stuff is going on. Line twelve. <coughs> Anyone knows what's going on here? Maybe it's just some other symbols, but I thought I'd check this. I finally <coughs> so in F stream, oops. In and out, okay. In and out, not uh, read and write. So now it's just missing a main, so it's otherwise happy. So let's put in a main. Okay. Now uh, we'll declare file vector fv, and I need to give it some names, right? So I said dump dot bin, same old file. And let's say my size is I don't know. Let's say one million. Okay. So I want one million elements in the vector, and uh, now what do I do? So f v dot put say five hundred thousand uh, three point four. Okay. So let's see if this at all compiles. So first, I'll remove that dumb dot bin file. Now I'll run uh, file vector dot exe finishes. Uh, there is no dumb dot bin. What happened there? Uh, was there a problem? There must be a runtime exception because of some reason. Let me drop this one and see if just the declaration goes through fine. There is still no dump dot bin. So clearly the creation itself is messing up. Um, let me try the following. So if we touch a file, then a zero length file is created, okay. It has no bytes, it's just an entry in the directory. Does that solve the problem? Let me take away this line. So it actually puts something. And now let's compile this and run that. So just to explain, the, the bug in my code is that you need to have more flags saying if the file does not exist, you should create it. Okay? So let us say it shrunk, see if that works. Okay? I am going to remove dump dot bin again and I am going to uh, compile and run this, see if the file is created this time. Yes, so that is what you need, saying if the file does not exist, create it with zero length uh, in binary mode to do both input and output. And now what happened here? The file has length two uh, million and four bytes. Why is that? Well, I declared the vector to be stored as having one million floating point numbers. That's actually four million bytes. Okay, but I only wrote the five hundred thousand number, which will happen at the Two millionth byte offset, halfway across. So it will opportunistically only allocate up to that point where it has to write. Okay, not beyond that. If you don't tell it to, can we hex dump it? If we hex dump it, you see something that it's full of zero bytes, null bytes. 
up to this offset where suddenly there are 4 bytes 9A995940 which is internal floating point representation for 3.4. So hex dump is very smart in not repeating garbage bytes if it is all zeros it will give a discontinuity if you want to be pedantic and print all of them let us find the flag to do that. Uh, Verbose is cause hex dump to display all input data. Any number of groups of output lines which would be identical to the immediately preceding group of output lines are replaced with a line comprising of a single asterisk. Okay. So, if you do not want that, then so this is what happens. This asterisk means that the line of null bytes or zero bytes repeats many times. If you do not want that, you also pass a verbose flag, and now you see that there are lots of lines with zeros in them. Actually, I should. So, lots and lots of lines with 0 bytes until you reach the 2 millionth byte where 2 million through 2 million 4 bytes are those 4 precious bytes that we wrote 3.4. Okay. Now, this looks terrible right I mean I just wrote 1 byte and or 4 bytes and 2 million bytes were allocated. But the funny part is that in Unix, Unix is smart enough to create what are called files with holes in them. So, this shows up as taking 2 million and 4 bytes, but actually does not cost the file system that. To find out, you can actually ask how many kilobytes of storage does I think so, let us see. Yeah. So, how many how many blocks of storage does dumb dot bin actually cost the file system? Just 4, four blocks. Okay. So, D uses disk usage. The disk usage by dumb dot bin file is actually very small. Once you start writing into the earlier locations, then it will start taking space. Yeah. Yes. That will be much lower. Yes. The size would be like 24 or something. Then it would use all those files. It depends. It allocates a small prefix of the file. It is unclear how much. I do not really know. So, suppose this was replaced by 5. Okay. Let me delete the file again. Compile this guy. 24 bytes with the payload being in bytes 20 through 23. Yeah. This is byte 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 24, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So, 24 bytes in all. So, what is the summary here? The summary is that uh, you know we could grow this indefinitely, you could pass a size which is gigabytes. The file system even my tiny laptop has gigabytes of space left, you can easily store it. And this is not as absurd as it sounds because now with large flash disks which are somewhere between the speed of RAM and hard disk, you can easily keep very very large data structures like this in flash disk. Where it is a file on flash disk, but it is much faster than actual moving head hard disks. Okay. So, there are many applications including modern distributed file systems which keep a lot of their directory structure on flash for very fast access. Okay. There are companies which specialize in multi level storage strategies for distributed file systems which use tricks like this to store their data and metadata like directory data, file data they are partly cached in flash when the thing is idle they push it back into hard disk that sort of thing. So, that is uh, that's pretty much that. So, the summary is we were only able to scratch the surface of computing as the intention was. If I intended anything more, I would have been mad. But uh, so, we started with basic syntax how to declare variables, constants, then statements, if then else loops, um, you know, followed by basic aggregate data types like 1D arrays and 2D matrices, looping through them, solving interesting, sorting, searching numerical algebra type problems. Then we went into uh, functions, um, how to break up your code into different modules so that things are maintainable and readable more easily by yourself as well as others. Then we looked at recursion. Um, we looked at techniques like dynamic programming which can cache partial results of recursion and make things fast and take less storage. 
um, then we went into objects, uh, structs, objects, classes, members, methods. Uh, then we looked at memory management. How do you take memory from the heap and return it when you choose to, except you know, instead of having to give it up when the scope closes. Uh, you can pass it around. Uh, one more comment I'd have to make from the pointer slide right at the end. Yeah, this is important. So of course, since you, are, you created a pointer to a record, you want to pass the pointer around in your application between very different data structures. In general, you want multiple pointers to the same record in application. Otherwise, why are you doing it anyway? Uh, for example, you could have a bank program where fixed deposit accounts and checking accounts point to the same shared customer record. But you need care in destructors. Okay. Uh, deleting a checking account should not destroy a customer record because the customer may still be holding a fixed deposit account. Okay. So, but should deleting the last account of a customer delete the customer record? Who knows? Probably not because you might have tax reporting obligations until the end of the next financial year. Okay. So these are partly policy, but partly also program design. There are packages by which you can do memory allocation not directly from C++, but through someone else's package, who will keep track of the number of references to a pointer, and delete the storage when the reference count goes down to zero. Okay. Now this is not a panacea for memory management, because of the following story. So uh, there's this famous professor at Stanford, John Backus, I think, uh, who used to code in Lisp because they used to do AI. Uh, and in Lisp, long before Java, there was this problem of garbage collection. If the user doesn't need some memory anymore, how do you free it back to the system without an explicit delete? See, Java doesn't require an explicit delete. It will take back memory when it can. Okay. So how to identify memory that the user cannot access anymore and therefore that can be reclaimed has always been an intriguing problem. Okay. So one day a graduate student um, ran into John Backus's office and said, I found a way for perfect you know, uh, free memory reclamation from the system. John Backus patiently sat the student down and said, let me tell you a story. One day a graduate student ran into John Backus's office shouting, I have found a perfect way of memory reclamation. So you see where this is going. So we've already seen that we can do linear linked lists. And suppose instead of the tail, the going to null, I chain it back to the head. That's a circular data structure where every node has reference one, but there may be no external pointer into this list. So clearly reference counting is not enough. Okay, you have to trace all possible paths from variables in your code into the heap and see how much can be accessed. Now that is called a mark and sweep garbage collection strategy. You mark anything that in the heap that you can access and you sweep away the rest. That's one part of what Java uses for memory reclamation. So anyway, so coming back to C++ where you have to be in charge of memory releasing, you need clean policies which are well documented in large code so that even when you're sharing pointers between multiple collection objects, you have a very clean, reliable way of releasing the memory at just once. Okay, for example, here you might decide that deleting the last account deletes the customer. That's well defined. Or you might say that there is a home collection which is the primary determiner of the memory allocation policy. And no matter which other data structure you're copying pointers to, those are not in charge of freeing up the memory. So, if you, so, so far we have used vector of ints, vector of floats. What if I have a vector of int star or vector of customer star? When the vector is destroyed, C++ will not call delete on each of the customers by default. Okay. If you want to do that, you have to override the vector's default destructor. So you should write your program such that all but one data structure does not delete the elements on destruction of the collective. Whereas that last home collection, when that is destroyed, that should go through every item and destroy the pointers. Okay. So if you keep the memory allocation cleanly separate in destructors and constructors, and you have clean policies for who is in charge, who owns the memory logically, then you'll avoid a lot of needless bugs and frustration. So now coming back to, you know, after pointers, we ended up the course with a small treatment of file IO. Without being at the mercy of less than, less than, and greater than, greater than to do ASCII oriented IO, we found a way to dump primitive variables into disk and out of disk directly, exactly like the memory image. And now if you have composite objects, for every one you have to write some routines, methods, which will decompose the composite into primitives, maybe recursively. 
okay. So, maybe this load stored of a container object should call load stored in the content object. If I have a vector of ints, I know how to directly store ints. If I have a vector of customers, I do not know how to store or load customers. Therefore, the store method in the vector of customers has to call a store method in each customer in turn. And they just keep on appending bytes to this random access file. And then the store of the outer guy finishes. Similarly for loads. So, load stores are also recursively cascaded into collection objects. Okay. That is how Java works. That is how Java serialization works by which you can pass objects not only onto disk and back, but even onto network and back. When you do a Google query, there is a lot of quantitative data that passes back and forth between your browser and the Google server. Much of it is actually structured data, okay. including did, it, did your mouse dwell on a particular link for more than a certain number of seconds. Okay. That triggers an event and that is communicated to Google. So, all this communication is done on a network and in fact, the network looks surprising like a disk, it is just a sequence of bytes. You open a socket, you pump in a sequence of bytes. You open a socket, you read a sequence of bytes. So, whatever applies with F streams with very minor modifi modification also applies to sockets over the network. Okay. So, anyways, that is the end of the course. The course is not over by any means. So, there is a lot of activity left. On Sunday, there will be the lab quiz. I think on Sunday, we will be able to fit four lab quiz slots and then there will be a makeup separate from that some other day. It is all in the calendar. I do not have it in my mind right now. Uh, suitable crypt slots have been set up for all pending exams. Finals are on 30th. And thereafter, we have the uh, uh, correction and crib sessions all planned out. So, the important thing is, you know, please watch the calendar carefully because uh, unlike earlier on in the course, if you slip up now and then everyone will leave for vacations, it is very hard to make up. So, try to be there for everything that is important. There should be also another session of special tutorials to make up for all the damage. So, please try to attend that if you can. Uh, so, this is being videotaped. Uh, last lecture, up to last lecture, we have all the videos now. So, make sure you watch those. For the final exam, make sure you uh, compile, run and understand all sample codes. There are quite a lot of them. They together cover a lot of ground. So, uh, that is probably the most important thing to do for preparation. Read the sample codes and understand them.